Welcome everyone for our Dharma Talk Soul Talk on Sunday, July 9th. And we are in the frequency of super abundance. I'm really excited to be giving this teaching today. And as some of you know, I did a shift network course on opening the portals of super abundance. And this work just gets getting deeper and deeper. And I, I received that term from a light body activation that happened in January. And then the gene keys, this gene key 53. And it is the shadow of immaturity, the gift of expansion, and the city of superabundance. So I'm asking those who are hearing and listening now to have the ears to hear and the eyes to see, because this is not ordinary reality. So if you remember from some of the transmissions prior, we started to create a map of the imaginal world. And that map is a mystical map and it comes from mystical traditions. Every major religion has a mystical tradition. And in those traditions, the way they say God may be different, but what they're pointing to is the same. And mysticism is the branch that has left dogma. It uses the structure of that religious tradition to anchor as like banks to a river, but it doesn't get bogged down with dogma and with rules and law. And that was indeed what Christ came to earth, the embodiment of heaven on earth, walked feet on earth in order to bring the understanding that the kingdom of God is in your heart. It is not a literal place. It's not something that you can check the box. It is not something that you can follow a rule and get in. It's already here in your heart and it is accessed through love. So we're gonna see in the gene keys in the gift of expansion, the three pieces of expansion are awareness, love, and creativity. Awareness, love, and creativity. And that is the, the transcending of Maslow's hierarchy of being. At the bottom level of that triangle is our survival needs. And if you've ever been in survival, you understand that it's freaking important to survive. <laughs> this conversation is gonna be a both and conversation. We are not gonna spiritually bypass the body, but we're also not gonna stay in the body. Because for those of us who are called to walk this path, this is the path of both and. This is the path of spirit in a body. This is a path of heaven on earth. And I have a story that I just heard today. Of course I did so that I could bring it to you because it's part of the magic and the miracles that super abundance is pointing to. And this is why I love this because it, it lures us in with this title called super abundance. It's in the ring of seeking. And we're like, oh yeah, I want some of that. And that could be because on your triangle and the Maslow's hierarchy of being, you could be struggling with your survival issues. And it might also be because you've chosen a new way. You've chosen to prioritize your heart, your spiritual path. And so today's message gets to bring you a both and. How do you meet the needs of that lower level of your own safety, security, the food on your table, the roof over your head? Those are all really important. 
because that's on the bottom and we build our life on top of that. And the highest level of need, the spiritual need, the soul need comes as it's built on top of that triangle. So if you're on the bottom of the triangle right now, you get to have ears to hear the both and. And if you are, if those needs are covered, then you get to expand in your awareness, in your love and in your creativity. So for the last few days, I have been watching this free series on angel.com called The Chosen. Has anyone ever have heard of that? It's really going around in Christian circles. It's a platform. I really, the, the platform is brilliant. And on this platform is this of the stories of Yeshua, the stories of the Christ. And some of you know, I grew up in a Christian, very evangelical, even fundamentalist household. And that did not work for me after, uh, <laughs> after my awakening. Um, I went to a religious college. I was highly inculcated in the teachings, but not in the teachings of mysticism, more in the teachings of dogma. And how many of you can relate to that being inculcated? Yeah, I know some of your stories <laughs> inculcated in dogma, right? Like just do the right thing. I don't care. No one tended to my heart when I was younger. No one cared about how I felt, what I thought. It, there was no emphasis on agency, on free will. There was no emphasis on even development or self-development, um, self personal growth. It was always about an external thing telling me what I should believe. And we already know as, as spiritual women that belief, you know, we live in duality. The equal and opposite always exists. So it's not about believing in that way, through the ego. And so interestingly enough, on my path of this light body activation that opened me up to the world of superabundance, which is the world of the imaginal. And remember, we talked about this with Gurdjieff and his world 24. So for those of you who don't remember, you can go back to the teachings, um, from a couple of weeks ago. And if I can remember which one it was, I will put it in the notes. And those teachings about the map of the imaginal world share with us that the rules that exist in three-dimensional reality do not exist on, on level or world 24. There are rules that do exist. There are 24 of them. And that's where the, the number comes from. So there, there are half, half of the rules that live here. Here we have the density of rule of world 48. But there is no, there's accidents, there's, there's luck, but that's not the world of magic and serendipity. That comes from the imaginal world. So I wanna connect those teachings because we're going to bring in the world of miracles. Now, a true bona fide miracle is something that comes from the imaginal world and, and stacked on top of the imaginal world. If we go up that hierarchy, we have world 12. Thank you. June 4th was the teaching. Myrna knows all that. I love that. Thank you. June 4th from that teaching of the worlds, the map of mysticism. So the worlds go higher and higher and the rules are less and less, but they are more binding. There is a purity that is required to enter the world of the imaginal. World 12 is the world of the sun. S-O-N-S-U-N. -S -S it is the world of the Christ. It is the world of embodying heaven on earth. And that is our province as humans. On we're living on world 48, our province is to bring in the sun, radial heart energy. And that is the world of superabundance. 
And that's the world of the miracles. And a bona fide miracle is something that happens that causes you to rethink your belief about reality. It shifts everything. You believed one thing and then this thing happened and then it shifted your entire perception. Your awareness opened and you now see more of the nature of reality. Think about that. That is what we get to call forth. It takes practice. It takes intention. And it takes a purity of heart. So in my path of this teaching, and I was talking about the chosen, watching these movies, these, I'm in season two now. I'm trying not to binge watch it just because <laughs> I end up staying up too late and it ruins my whole circadian rhythm. So I'm trying not to binge watch and just pace myself, but it's actually fascinating because what happened for me is through the world of Mary Magdalene, and I don't think these, I don't think the, the makers of this series um, had enough of a download of the feminine, the divine feminine. Um, so I'm just holding that as I am taking it for what it's worth in these, in this rendition of the life of Christ. And what I'm seeing inside of it, just, just coming at it with an open blank slate is that they really captured the, the zeitgeist of the times when the imaginal world broke through world 48, our world, it broke through it in the form of the Christ and miracles were performed. This is the stories that we may know from our childhood of Jesus, Yeshua being at a wedding and they ran out of wine and he goes into the cellar and prays and more wine is, is created than they even had to begin with. So this filmmaker does an incredible job of capturing the excitement. Like what if you were present in that moment when, and you were getting yourself in a total tizzy, like the guests have no more wine. And that's a, that's a reflection of love and social status and all the, our, our, all the rules of uh, our social rules. And so they capture this excitement of what it feels like to be in the presence of a holy man and what it feels like to be in the presence of a miracle. And so under wraps, Christ performed all these miracles. And when he met these disciples, it goes to the story of how he met these disciples. And when he encountered each of the disciples, it, it, I can feel it already in my heart. He knew them. And he says, you know, they say like, you knew me before I even knew myself. You knew me. So imagine that being seen. So, so, and what Jesus is seeding in, in these stories is that greater works are coming. Much greater things are coming than even what I am doing right here. Can you guys imagine that? even greater things are coming. And then when you pair that with the world of the divine feminine and the opening of the understanding of the early Christians and the Gnostic texts, the Gnosis, knowing from inside yourself not knowing from outside yourself because someone told you that this is what it means, but gnosis, having the revelation, the spontaneous revelation of knowing something 
even if you can't explain it. And those who walked with the Christ came into their own gnosis. These stories show like kind of what a shit show it was at the beginning. Like you bring all these rogue people together. Some of them were criminals. Some of them were tax collectors and hated and despised. All, all these different people from different walks of life <clears throat> sharing a common theme of having their heart blown open and receiving gnosis. And then they have their personalities trying to get along and who's going to be in charge and who's the favorite. And so we get to see that there's our humanity is always present. And as a part of our evolutionary development, Ken Wilber talks about this in the integral theory, there's states and stages. We can have a, like a state of consciousness that opens up the imaginal field and we can still be at a lower level of worldview, a low stage, and we get to walk the paces. And that's what Jinky 53 says because the shadow is in maturity. And it's saying like, that's okay. We all start there. There's no bypass. Every level of development in the hierarchy of worldview has to be included and transcended. So that means that there's no skipping worldviews. You get to walk through them and there's stages. And Jinky 53 is highlighting that at the lowest level, at the stage, at the shadow frequency, we are immature. And even all the disciples were immature. They just didn't know. So yes, they had gnosis. They had this awakening, a quickening. And then they had to grow into that. They had to grow into being mature people. And one of the things that we know on the spiritual path that is a marker of maturity is when you can see that there is nothing separately real. Everything is one thing. It's a hologram. So I did a medicine journey over the Independence Day holiday <laughs> in the US. And inside of that medicine journey, you know, my intention, I'm going to share a little bit about it because I feel like I've done, it's been about five days of integration. Normally, um, I, I learned my lesson very early on in doing medicine journeys that if I talk about it, it just blows the energy all over the place. But I've been sitting with it and it was such a, an impeccably held container that a lot of integration got to happen even the day after. So I feel good about sharing with you some of what came through because it is in this world of Gene Key 53. So my intention was to open to more love, to experience myself as love. That's a pretty high intention. <laughs> and what I ended up going through was a deep portal of fear frozen fear. Have any, has anybody ever had frozen fear? <laughs> oh my God. I was like, I could not move. And what was interesting is I thought that that was not the journey. I just thought that that was the, that was, you know, I just was like, oh yeah, I haven't gotten into the journey yet. <laughs> no, that's the journey. I encountered myself. I encountered the frozen part of me that is scared to death. And what was that part? It's called the ego, the ego self that does not want to let go. It does not want to be out of control. It wants to know what's going to happen next, right? Because somewhere along the line, we came in as innocence. We were born in innocence. And we had human parents 
is that in some way we're not perfect and they conditioned us and to some degree they messed us up. They taught us not love. They taught us conditional love, <laughs> most of us. And then we get to return to love. We, we go on the human journey of forgetting that we're divine. We forget our incredible innocence and our beauty. And then we wake up to something, something along the path calls us forward. Something beckons us. Maybe it's like some world 24 breaks open your world 48 and you see a glimmer of the light and then begins your ring of seeking. So in that journey, I had to, um, I got to do a lot of shadow work. It was amazing. And the, the facilitators were so good at shadow work that we were like able to unpack. This was out after I got out of the frozen state because I literally could not move. <laughs> And once that wave passed, then I opened up and it was like my ego had receded. And that's one of the benefits of plant medicine. The ego default mechanism recedes. And then the awareness, which is the expansion of Jinky 53 opens up and you get to see more. And what do you see? You see hashtag hall of mirrors. Everything is a hall of mirrors. It is not apparent to the ego mind. The ego mind is about separation. Me and you, and you're doing stuff to me, <laughs> right? And you caused this. When I uh, got picked up from the airport, my friend was sharing with me about her husband and they have some tensions. And I said, yeah, I know that it looks that way. I know that it looks like it's over there. I get it. Hashtag hall of mirrors. And I can't show you how it's about you because I, because your psyche created this. It's protecting you from something. But that protection you no longer need. So a few medicine journeys are in our lifetime can be very helpful to seeing what it is we cannot see. So what I took away from that is that my intention, where I wanted to go in my heart, I had to go through the block to that place. I had to go to the fear and to that part of me that was assigned from a very young age to protect myself. And it indeed even said to me, I will never let you go. I'm here to protect you. <laughs> And I was like, and wait a minute, <laughs> right? I don't need you for that anymore. So it's a deep process. Um, and that is, that is the indicia of maturity. And so if we're on the path and we get triggered by other people, fantastic. That is your opportunity to take that trigger and to get really curious in the space of love. So one of the things that, uh, that happened in this journey was a deep incarnational no. So I started to understand that what that what I was experiencing as the journey progressed was this moment before I incarnated and I took on the suffering of my mother, I realized that I, that I was a no. Has anyone ever had that experience? Like you could feel that a part of you said no to wanting to be here? Yeah, thanks for your honesty. I actually had never thought that I said that, but I got really present to my no, and it was a fuck no. And so I stayed with my no, 
I didn't override my no. And I realized my soul was being given another opportunity to choose. Do you want to be here? It's a choice. And as I was in that moment, I, I was like, I honestly, I'm not a fuck yes. I'm not, I can't say yes right now. My no wants to be romanced a little bit more. Do you know what I'm saying by that? Yeah, sometimes we just override our no because it's not supposed to be that way. Like I'm here, hello. So clearly I'm choosing, but there was a part of me that never got to experience, no, I don't choose it. This place is hell. I don't like it. There's too much anguish. And I just got to be in that and feel that and just roar with that. And when I felt like I respected my no, cause I said something like, I, my no has just never been listened to. Anybody else feel like your no has never been listened to? Yeah. And then I realized it was me that wasn't listening. <laughs> yeah, I can't like Exactly. And so I was listening. I was there. I was like, yeah. And the facilitator was like, goddess, I honor that. Don't push it. Stay in the know until it gives of its own accord. And so her husband was saying, sharing to me that, that the book of Job, remember that book in the Old Testament? There's this book of Job and her husband said, it's basically a lawsuit against God. Here are all the reasons why you fucked up. This world sucks. People are suffering. Have you had that in your own mind? All the things that are wrong with this world and wondering what is wrong with God that you created this? Really? Is this, what, is this the best you could do? Right? Like that was my truth in that moment. And he was sharing with me that that was Job. He said that there were 38 chapters of Job complaining. And it was a dialogue with others and the others were defending. And, he, and this man is a pastor and he said, you know, God never reprimanded Job for that. He reprimanded the people for defending their boxes and the way he answered Job was he, he, he didn't answer Job. There was no answer to that. So if you have that, there's no answer to that. The way that I was answered by Divine Mother was that a scent of sweet grass started to permeate the room. World 24. We were like, what is that? And the facilitator said, that's your answer. And what God basically said to Job is, how can you know the mystery? You watch a sunset, you watch a sunrise, you see a whale breach, you see the aurora borealis. How can you know the mystery? That's the world of superabundance. It cannot be answered in words. It is not linear. It doesn't answer the ego's cry because the ego cannot understand this world. And the ego does not have the requisite heart and love to love this world. Those two sit side by side inside of us. The pain of this world, the love in this world. And the facilitator said, can you allow your pleasure to be a prayer for those who are suffering? Write that down. Can you allow your pleasure to be a prayer for those who are suffering? So many times we join people and that was my incarnational wound. I took on the pain of my mother and I had to give it back because it's not mine. This is her dignity. 
This is her dharma. And so I lovingly give her back her path and I restore myself to her daughter, not her superior, her daughter. So a lot gets accomplished in these medicine journeys. <laughs> And they're accomplished for the collective. So I'm going to, I'm going to spend a minute talking about that. And then we're going to, we're going to go into our sisterhood activation. So Gurdjieff says this, and Gurdjieff, as you know, is responsible for this mystical map. And I love these maps of, from the mystical traditions, because they're a, they're a blend, like the Tibetan book of the dead says the same thing, like the, the, Gurdjieff says the same thing, mystical Christianity, mystical Judaism. I mean, they're, they're pointing to the same thing. So Gurdjieff said that without a group, nothing is possible. So I got the hit this morning um, that this circle that we have is going to be morphed into a wisdom school. And these teachings, it's a place for these teachings. And one of the things that Gurdjieff said was that when you have World 24, like these kinds of uh, imaginal teachings coming through, you must have a structure. There must be a big enough structure to hold it. So fascinating that, and Gene Key 60 really talks about magic loves structure. So we get to have that as a collective, but what we're moving out of, and this is the world of superabundance, and this is what, when we start to mature on the spiritual path, we start to see that the other is us. So then it's easier to be in a group because the other is us. And we know what to do with our triggers. We, we look inward. Yeah, there are sometimes behavioral things like integral stage shares with us that not all ideas are good ideas and that there are some ideas that are better than others. So that's a maturing. And at the same time, an emotional trigger is here for us. That's, that's our work. And when we do that work of going inward and finding the seed of what needs to be met, then we increase in our maturity and our ability to function as a group evolves. I was thinking about that because Richard Rudd received these teachings from his group work with Ra Uduhu, who was a transmitter of human design. You know, Richard Rudd was an analyst with Ra, the very, one of the very first students. And so, and raw and human design, that work that was the, the foundation of the gene keys, it came through him raw, but the actual work that we know now was because of a group of people and groups of people and continues to evolve because of groups of people. So as we enter the Aquarian age, we're letting go of this idea that gnosis Divine inspiration, divine knowledge is coming to us as an individual. One of the things the mushrooms in plant medicine journeys is teaching is that it's relational. So you know how mycelium works, right? It's underground connecting the trees. They communicate, trees communicate through the mycelial network. So that phrase, it takes a village is very true. And inside these journeys, we get pieces of the puzzle. No one has the whole piece because light is filtered through our consciousness, through our template. This template is limited. It's structured. It's in three space. The substrate of my brain, if you were to like do a scan, you would see that my brain looks different from your brain. No one brain can hold the entire teachings. It is the mycelial network that holds the teachings. And that's what we're coming into in the Aquarian age. 
And I would stop here, except there's one more story I have to tell because it is the story of superabundance and what is possible. So as I was meditating this morning on my walk, I started listening at once again to Cynthia Bourgeau. She, she's the one I found through Megan Watterson and the teachings of Mary Magdalene and her book, The Eye of the Heart. I've listened to it several times. And so I just click on right where I'm at. <laughs> and here's the imaginal world coming through right here for all of us today in this world of superabundance. And she starts to talk about these souls who's, and she believes Gurdjieff is one of these souls who are tasked because they are of such a high stage of consciousness. They are tasked with bringing in the imaginal world for us. They are, they are the Jesus of the world. And some of them are only in soul form and some are embodied. And that, so there's this council, this council of light, this council of 36, I think it is which is probably more, and, and you know, um, Wayne Dyer talks about this and I don't know where he got it, but it's, he said that it takes like, he, he said the numbers of truly enlightened on different stages, ascended masters to hold this world in check. Because without that level of light frequency, the dark would just go like nuts. So I love that context because it, it really evokes that, guess what? You matter. The kind of light you are choosing to run through your system matters. So there's a story she told, and I want to tell it to you. The Eye of the Heart is, is uh, Cynthia Bourgeau. So this story she tells, and I swear to you, I did not hear this story before. I don't know how I listened to this several times and I did not hear this story, but I did not hear the story, right? This is the story for you. She talks about that there are historical incidences when a, a shift occurred. And I, and I think that she, she wrote this book and it was released in 2020. I mean, I would include like the pandemic and lockdown and all that, I would include that here as well. It, one of them was when the Chinese occupied Tibet in 1959. Uh, another one was uh, the, the beginning of Islam. And then there's this third story that she told, and I love this story. So during World War II, Gurdjieff was living in Paris and the Nazis occupied Paris. And in fact, they were a quarter of a mile from his home. And apparently during, there is a book, of, it's called Is Paris on Fire? And maybe, um, Vanessa, maybe you've read that. But I want to read it now because this is the story of the Nazis um, feeling that, so the Allied forces, the United States and others had um, just landed in Normandy and were going to liberate France from the Nazis. And so there was pressure. They felt that they knew that. So the Nazis planted bombs underneath main cultural sites like Notre Dame. And we're going to just blow the place up before they, if they got captured and left, you know, they, that was their plan. And I, and, and there's probably way more to tell in this book is Paris burning, but this is just a snippet. And anyway, Gurdjieff was among some that did not leave town. There were a lot of spiritual teachers, mystics who got the hell out of there. Artists, you know, people who just knew they needed to go. But he said, no, he's going to stay. And these are two separate stories. And Cynthia Borjo says that she has this sense that they're related. But the first story is the story of superabundance. He decides. There's no food, you know, it's a, it's a war zone. You, you, you know, you can't get consistent electricity and all the things, right? Can you, you can imagine like your, the conveniences of life are not available to you. 
So in his own way, he decides to go on a quest of abundance. And he gathers not just a bunch of food, but a bunch of opulent food, fine wines, chocolates, just stuff that you can't go to the store and get, you can't Instacart it. <laughs> it's, it's not readily available. But because he is rooted and he has dedicated his life and he's a practitioner and a, and a hmm, yeah, a devotee of world 24, he offers the most incredible banquet. And that kind of banquet, like that's like that movie Babette's Feast and Cynthia Bourgeau talks about Babette's Feast because it's a metaphor, not of, it's shocking to our ego mind that during a war, we would have a feast. But it's this interruption and holding that suffering as, alongside that pleasure at the same time, letting your pleasure be the prayer, opening up to love in the middle of a war zone. So what would it be like if you were able, if you were the one who in whatever circumstance you find yourself, that your pure dedication and your pure heart causes abundance in a, in a super abundant way, super meaning above and beyond. It's not even about abundance. It's a way of being. So then let's, let's step over to the second story. And the second story, related or not related, I mean, who will know? Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? The second story is where meetings were happening. This, this book is Paris Burning, talks about this intention to blow Paris up. And meetings were happening. And then the idea just simply receded. It never happened. And you know how like you're on a course and then all of a sudden the energy just drops on that course. And, and I've had that happen in very mundane ways. Like I think it's this and the energy is there. And then all of a sudden the energy is gone and it is not there anymore. And it's almost like, I forget I'm even talking about that. Right? <laughs> And that's what happened. As we know, history, there, are, there were no bombs blowing up Notre Dame. And so Cynthia Bourgeau says, you know, I don't know and I can't prove it, but is, are those two related? But maybe we just leave it as a question. Are those two related? Because the world of the imaginal, the world of superabundance does not function in physical but for causality. It's not linear. It has a whole other, it's like chaos theory. It has all kinds of spherical, three-dimensional relationships, not linear, two-dimensional relationships, spherical relationships. And those spherical relationships, like, like the famous chaos story of like a, you squash a butterfly and some, you know, an earthquake happens in China, <laughs> you know, like they're the relationship of all of us because we are all one. And so the move from immaturity is the move to seeing our oneness. And the first step along the way is to wake up from the dream of the separate self. And that opens the gateway to the imaginal world. I'm gonna end here and then we'll go into our sisterhood activation. Let us gather all this positive energy that we have generated here and then beam this out. Just imagine the possibility that we referenced as a disciple at the time of witnessing miracles, having your mind blown of someone coming up to you, speaking your name and your past and your heart, and you've never met them before. 
to the stories of in history where mass consciousness like Buddhism and the teachings of Buddhism are brought to the West and the teachings of Gurdjieff available here and now, all the ways that the mystical world has penetrated our world. Let's just gather that, fill it in your heart space and beam it out for the benefit of all beings. Namaste.